Hello and welcome to our Emotionally Healthy Schools podcast series where we are showcasing and celebrating good practice in some of our Derby City schools. Today I'm joined by Debbie Rollison who is the designated senior lead for mental health at Homefields Primary School. Hello Debbie. Hello Ingrid. Um, so tell us a bit about Homefields Primary. Well, Homefield is in Chelliston, um, and we're in a beautiful area um, right near the A50. So it's quite a it's a quite an affluent area, but the the children um, still have as many um, social and emotional needs as you'd get in inner city schools, but just from a different angle. Um, there's about 356 children in the school. We have a nursery all the way to year six, so a, a primary school. Um, Yes, so we're in the leafy suburbs of Chelston. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, so tell us a bit about um, some of the issues that you have as a school around emotional um, well-being and, um, and what you've been able to do about it. So when I was um, first introduced to the project, um, I came to the meetings, the network meetings, um, and I wondered which direction to go in. So um, it was really interesting listening to what other schools were doing and I was scribbling down notes thinking, well, I could do this, I could do this and the other. Um, but it was, it's very much thinking about what you need for your school. And although what other schools were doing were brilliant, it's I needed to think what our school needed um, and looking at those different strengths and different starting points. So um, I realised that... I needed to just look at our school and it was really interesting using the questionnaires to start off with as a starting point. Um, I felt that our school had a really positive feel um, and it's a huge strength for staff, visitors, parents, children, all alike comment on how amazing our school is, is as a place to be. Um, staff have created a caring, nurturing environment and that everybody goes out their way to make everyone who walks through the door feel welcome. Um, we plan through uh, for well-being through PSHE, um, and staffs are always we, we get together lots. So there's the, always that um, that sense of well-being because we we're together as a family. Um, and so it's quite difficult to think of to start off with where I needed to go. So using those um, questionnaires was quite interesting because it gave me a very different perspective to what I thought was going mm. on. Um, so with the questionnaires, one of the first things that threw up a few, uh, surprise was that I thought that we did really, really well at supporting our children um, through their emotional, their emotional health. Um, and when, when I read, because I read every single one that came back, it was really interesting. There was, there was some that I didn't expect to see, and that really shocked me because I thought we'd planned for it as a school. Um, and one of the little girls in year six had been through the school. She'd been in my class. And it really, really upset me that when I read hers, she said that she felt lost and unhappy most of her time at school. And that as a staff, we hadn't noticed this. Um, and so I knew that that was something that I needed I needed to do for the children to give them a voice to let them she didn't feel that she could talk to her class teachers that she needed somebody out so I knew that was a direction I could go in with the, ch the children the parent questionnaire that came back and um, there was a range of answers from parents saying that they knew everything about mental health and what they could do for their children what poor mental health looked like and how to fix it um, and then we had the opposite side where some parents hadn't got a clue about mental health so I thought that would be an easy fix that I could get something because we hadn't got anything on the website about mental health that I could make an area on the website that parents could go in and have a look at where we could give advice, information, support and, and tell parents what we're doing in school about mental health. So that was quite a nice, easy fix. Staff were much harder to solve. <laughs> um, so I sent out the questionnaires to staff and we had staff meetings where I asked staff to be really honest and talk about what stressed them most about work and what took most of the time and, and what we could do to change. But staff were, um, they're, they're just so amazing. Everything that I suggested that we could either cut out or adapt, their answers were, but this is really important and it makes an impact on the children so we can't get rid of it. Oh. <laughs> um, so I managed, I managed to prize some of the areas of staff that could be adapted and improved. So um, I chose some small things straight away that we could change, like 
making sure that staff meetings kept time because time mm -hmm. felt like one of the most important things that we could change. Um, so we now make sure that staff meetings start exactly on time and finish exactly on time so that if staff need to go and do other things, they've got time in school, or if they want to leave at that time, they can do. So that was a, a real quick fix that we could do. Um, we also then looked at um, making sure that like AOB, the, any of the business for staff meetings, that staff made us aware before staff meetings and didn't just throw them in. Because again, that added to the extra timing. So those were quick fixes we could do straight away. Um, we also looked at emailing because we ended up finding that some staff were being emailed at 11 o'clock at night because that's when people worked at 11 o'clock at night. But if you were uh, early morning and were getting uh, emails late at night, um, that would wake you up, that would add to the stress. Um, whereas if you worked in the morning, you emailed really early in the morning, that would upset people who were still in bed. So we've made sure that there's a, a time constraint that you, uh, you put on the scheduling. Didn't even know that existed, but there's oh, a scheduling yeah. button. <laughs> Just so that we're not disturbing people's patterns. We, we understand that people have to work in their own, their own way. So some people are early risers, some people work better at night time, but just that scheduling and not being bombarded with emails was just a, a quick fix mm. that we could do. Other things were much bigger and needed um, a whole SLT, um, sort of working together on that. Um, so one of the things we changed with was the summer reports. Um, we made it so we, we as a staff, love to talk about the children. So our report formats were very, very wordy and we'd have a lot of writing in there. So we've, we changed that, made it much shorter so there were a lot more tick boxes about um, what objectives the children had reached, but then there was still space for staff to write. And that, we had so much uh, feedback from staff saying how brilliant that was in the summer term that they could do that because we still wrote reports even though the children weren't here because of COVID. And they said that saved them so much time. So they were really impressed with that. Um, we also looked at our assessment systems and have been able to work at the core subjects and the foundation subjects and adapt our assessment process to make it much easier to fill in. Because again, it's that length of time that staff have to spend doing these things that just add to that workload and stress. So we've looked at assessment and made that much easier to work with. Um, so that's really helped the anxieties and stress factors for teachers. Um, for the children, uh, we, we looked at, uh, so we sent lots of our staff, had four members of staff go on um, the mental health first aiders course. Ah. Um, and we've worked at uh, getting post boxes around the school so that the children could, um, if they didn't feel they could talk to their teachers, could post their anxieties. Um, we made slips that uh, the children could either write on or if they didn't want to share their concern in writing because it was in a box and somebody might see it, there was, they just need to put their name and their class and then there were some pictures at the bottom of um, whether they were sad or whether they were angry or whether they were frustrated or whether something, so there's a little picture at the bottom that they could just tick and then our mental first faders would pick that up, they'd check the boxes every day, um, and they'd pick that up and, and talk to the children about it. Mm. So were you getting a lot of um, a lot of posted into the post boxes? Well, we did a lot of work with the children um, in classes as well. There was a whole school approach on this. So we did assemblies on it, um, where we talked about, because they needed the introduction of what mental health was. Mm -hmm. As I said, we already do a, a lot of stuff in school already, but it was actually labeling it talking about mental health and we do this to improve our mental health um, so we did lots of assemblies and uh, we did lots of work on class and said it's it's not for one of those things where they've taken my pencil i'm not happy about it, it wasn't for that that's for the class teacher to deal with it was for those bigger emotions so yeah there were some little things that could be dealt with straight away some things were passed back to teachers um, but then we've, um, we have meetings each half term where we talk about those children that mental first aiders have seen. And it might be that it was a quick fix one, one time. It might be that there was a series where the um, mental first aiders saw the child each week and caught up with them and did some work with them each week. 
if it went on much longer, we then referred them to the learning mentor so they could have regular sessions each week. If it was bigger than that, we've actually referred some children um, to outside agencies as well. So we've we've actually picked up on children that were going under the radar before. So really pleased with that. Great, yeah. Um, we've also, uh, for the children, um, we set up last year with our year six children uh, a mental health first aid degree with the children. So these children had to apply for the post. They had to write a CV to say why they'd be good at it. Um, talking about all their skills and attributes that would make them a good listener or um, why they thought this, they'd be good for the post. Um, and then we uh, did some training with these children. So it was a series of six, uh, over six weeks of the children learning how to listen, how to um, make sure that these children understood that if it was a big problem that it would have to be passed to an adult of how to work out small issues in the playground. And so they went through this extensive training. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we couldn't carry that out fully. Mm. Uh, but really interesting, I've had one of the little girls come back, she's now at the secondary school, and said, I'm the mental first aider for my form class because it was it meant so much to me. She's gone on um, and done that in her form at, at secondary school. So I was really proud that she'd oh, taken great. all the all the stuff that we've done, all the uh, workshops that we've done, and she's carried that on into secondary school. So really pleased with that. As soon as we can, we'll carry on with that in school. Um, but at the moment, we can't mix pods, but that's it's already in place. So we can carry on with that easily. Um, we use some of our grant funding to um, change some of the rooms around in school. And we've now got, we've spent our money on a nurture room. So we've got an area where our learning mentor can work with some of the more complex issues that we have, um, some of our behavioural issues or our some of the children need that nurturing environment. So we've we've used it so we can fund that room and then um, that's working really well that we're we're seeing parents coming back and saying the work that you're doing with my child has made such a huge impact. So I'm really pleased with that nurture room that we've mm. set up. Um, and we also um, set up, so in early years, we've uh, for years we've done yoga and mindfulness and I could just see the benefits that this has on our children. We'd have uh, children going back to their parents saying, Mummy, I think you're stressed. I can see you're anxious. You need to do some tummy breathing. Or, Mummy, I think you need to do this. So we've had lots of feedback from early years parents about saying how brilliant it is. Or their child would say, Mummy, I, I feel really worried about this. Um, I need to do some breathing. And so they're telling their parents they can... They're seeing what their feelings are. They're actually understanding them and knowing how to sort them out. So I knew that this is a huge thing that needs to go across the school. So as NSLT, we put that into our performance management for staff. So TAs and uh, uh, teaching staff had it as their performance management to. So I, I did staff meetings on it to help them understand and see the importance. And then they had to put it into their everyday teaching so now we have a mindfulness practice throughout the school in each class and it's just lovely to see teachers either have a, a time slot so they know that their children um, feel anxious when they come back in from playtime so they do it then some teachers use it as a we've done this activity let's have a breather let's get ourselves back into you know the zone some teachers use it after they've done an activity and they uh, they need a complete change of mindset so they'll I'll do some mindfulness then. Oh. We also do it for some of our children who have challenging behaviours. Instead of them just sitting outside in the corridor for something that they've done wrong, it doesn't get rid of the behaviour that sent them there in the first place. So we've worked with some of our complex behavioural children of understanding those emotions that causes the behaviour on the playground. So we've had... I've, I've run workshops with some of the children to help them with those behaviours and I've had brilliant reports back from parents just saying it's really, really helped these children with their behaviours and, and them understanding. And again, they've helped their parents in turn at home. The children have helped the parents to say, again, I, I think you need to have a go at this, mummy. Wow. So we're seeing so that whole, in whole impact. And how have the teachers found using it? Have they, have they all sort of adapted to it? Have they all taken it on board? So... For some teachers, I think they already had that practice. So I know that some mm. of the teachers already did yoga or mindfulness out of school. So for them, dead easy, 
got it into the class. But others, it was very alien. And so they needed a lot more support because, well, that's just another thing you're throwing at me. I've got this to do and this to do and this to do. And now you're adding to my stress by asking me to do something else. Mm. Um, and when we showed them that it doesn't have to be a huge session, it literally is. It could just be just stopping and breathing for the count of 10, you know, breathing in, breathing out. And, and they suddenly realise that actually I can fit this in. It's not a huge thing. And we've, we've done a lot of workshops with um, staff to show them the brain patterns and what happens when the child is anxious, that they're not going to learn anyway. So you might as well stop bring in the breathing, calm them down, and then the learning will happen much easier for them. Mm. So, so for, yes, yeah, some staff, it was much easier than others, but um, I think it's, as we're such a, a helpful school, it wasn't just me able to go in and help. It's we blent on each other for that support. Yes. Oh, thank you so much. Um, so in terms of the wider impacts of this work on the school, um, how, how, what have you noticed the, the impacts have been of, of being on this, on this journey, on this programme? Well, I think for me, it went from me thinking, well, we do lots in our school. We're a really caring school. We're told all the time by parents and visitors that, you know, how brilliant we are to actually, there were gaps and, um, there were gaps that we've, we've not seen as a staff. So it was brilliant to be able to plug those gaps. It's been really interesting seeing the staff's journey. So some people on board straight away and they could put things into, into their class. For other people, it felt really strange. Um, so it, it was much harder for them. Um, mm. The impact on the children has been amazing that we've had uh, children say, I love mindfulness. It really helps me calm down. I prefer um, mindfulness colouring. That helps me to zone out. That helps me to calm me down. I like my, some children, uh, we've built um, mindfulness corners where they can go and I know when I'm getting angry so I can go and use the mindfulness corner to um, to just bring myself down and help my anxieties or my stress or frustration or whatever it is. So the children are actually using that and understanding what uh, positive mental health is and how they can help themselves and they're also looking for the signs of more negative mental health and what they can do to help themselves in that as well mm -hmm. uh, I think staff have also realized that they've they have a choice in some of the things so if um, if we've set deadlines for times then it's your choice to work over those times and it's so hard teaching is so hard because there's it never ends does it there's always yeah. something else you can do and it's giving them permission to understand that it'll always be there um there'll always be more things to do but giving yourself permission to do what is needed to be done to get those children to where they need to be and and sometimes giving yourself permission to say okay it's not going to get done today it will get done but just not today um, and I think that's been a huge lesson for some, for lots of us that um, for our own mental health, we have to step back in. And what we're preaching to the children, we need to do ourselves. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Well, that's a perfect way to end things. So thank you so much, um, Debbie, for, for talking and, um, and thank you all for listening. <laughs>